she felt she'd never be taken seriously. Soon after, she left town for a while to try to put the nightmare behind her. Anchorage authorities were willing to let it drop, too. I found out because the uh, alibis were corroborated and because they had a problem with Cindy Paulson appearing and disappearing and, of course, her lifestyle left a lot to be desired, that the case had been suspended at the Anchorage Police Department. Police had gathered no solid evidence linking her story to Robert Hansen. But for Officer Greg Baker, it wasn't over. He was one officer who believed Paulson's story and wouldn't let it go. The predator roaming the streets of Anchorage was still out there, free to claim more victims. Robert Hansen, the most likely suspect in the abduction and rape of Cindy Paulson, had been released for a lack of solid evidence. Officer Baker was still curious. Lately, the Anchorage police had been grappling with what seemed like more than their share of missing persons reports involving prostitutes like Paulson, or exotic dancers, or women out by themselves. Paulson's assertion that she was about to be put on a plane only reinforced his creeping suspicions about Hanson. He had taken her to the airport where he was going to fly her out with the story that if she maintained her, her helpfulness that uh, he'd bring her back and let her go. Well, Cindy was bright enough to know that she was on a one-way trip, and uh, so was I. And so I kind of just put two and two together and figured that he was a very good suspect for the uh, missing dancers. Baker's supervisor had suspended the investigation into Robert Hansen, but Baker couldn't let it go. Cindy Paulson's nightmarish story had too much detail to not have some basis in truth. But no one except Baker would listen to her. He continued his investigation. On the surface, Baker found nothing in Hansen's record to arouse suspicion. He had moved to Anchorage from Iowa 16 years earlier and opened a bakery. It was a huge success. He had a wife and children, and except for his stutter, he fit in completely. When he wasn't in the kitchen, Hansen enjoyed flying his small airplane, a Super Cub Piper. Back on the ground, he took to the woods. He was a solid citizen. He just didn't fit the model of a serial killer. There were plenty of others drifting through Alaska more suited to that role. They didn't have businesses. They didn't have families. Hansen did. He had everything to lose. Frank Rothschild was a prosecutor involved in the Paulson case. Bob the Baker. The troopers and the police used to go to his donut shop all the time. It was a very popular place to go. Uh, he was, he had a, a bakery. People knew him. He was friendly. Uh, he was just a hard-working guy. Unaware of Officer Greg Baker's local investigation in Anchorage, state troopers were still trying to find their serial killer. Bodies continued to be unearthed in the Alaskan wilderness. Troopers set up a task force to study the similarities between the missing women and the murder victims. They hoped to find a common thread that would lead to a suspect. Until authorities knew more, they did their best to educate dancers and prostitutes about playing safe. For the first time, police and prostitutes were on the same side. According to Rothschild, the goal was preservation. Law enforcement were then and had been for a time advising young women who were working in some of these clubs and uh, who were working the streets uh, to be careful and to advise them there was a uh, a maniac out there who was who seemed to be abducting and killing people a little digging revealed that Hansen's criminal history was extensive 12 years earlier in 1971 he'd been arrested twice for kidnapping rape and assault with a deadly weapon they were crimes that bore an eerie resemblance to what Cindy Paulson had endured 
Baker couldn't bring this information to his supervisor. The Paulson case had been officially suspended, and Baker was bucking authority. That left him no alternative. And at that time, I gathered up all the reports and background that I could find on uh, Mr. Hansen and for, carried it over to the troopers. When the troopers received the file from Officer Baker, they were optimistic. Paulson's testimony, along with Hansen's police record from Anchorage, made him a prime suspect in the state case. The troopers' investigation dovetailed with Baker's. They were both dealing with the same maniac. Robert Hansen was their best suspect. I think everybody was looking at him real seriously because he made a good suspect when you looked into him. He had uh, a pretty extensive criminal background, including some sexual assaults. The only problem was the proof. Though Hansen was a violent sex offender, his record indicated nothing about being capable of homicide. Nor was there any direct link from him to Sherry Morrow, Paula Goulding, and the other missing women. At this point, troopers didn't even have enough for a search warrant. They knew only that three women were dead and 12 were missing. Out there lurked a serial killer. Troopers needed to catch him before he killed again. They needed help. We knew we had a mass murder on our hands. That was not something Alaska had any experience with. Somebody obviously knew that the FBI not only had experience with it, but had set out this unit that was designed specifically to try to assist in discovering who these people were. To catch a killer in their own backyard, the troopers called on help from over 3,000 miles away. Only the FBI had the resources needed to get inside a killer's head. When the Alaska State Troopers determined they had a serial killer on their hands, they realized they didn't have the expertise to stop him. But they knew who did. Quantico, Virginia is home to the FBI's investigative support unit. Here, agents attempt to predict behavioral patterns by analyzing a criminal's actions. Retired FBI agent John Douglas helped pioneer behavioral profiling and still works as a consultant. His profiles are based on 25 years interviewing convicted killers. They taught Douglas how to think like they do. He's learned that serial killers are acting out their fantasies of control and conquest. As Douglas slowly wins their trust, he takes them back to the scene of their crime. You finally get them talking, they start giving you that thousand yard stare. They're back, they're back 10 years ago, 20 years ago when they were perpetrating uh, the crime. And they kind of lock into that thousand yard stare and their memory is, is just so pr precise. And the fantasy is what keeps them going uh, over and over and, and enables them to survive when they're incarcerated. So I got to tap into that. It takes time, but once I'm in there, I get tremendous information. From these interviews, he distilled a checklist of traits and habits that serial killers share. They start young, with lesser crimes such as arson or cruelty to animals. Over the years, their violence builds. To every new case, profilers bring the knowledge of how killers evolve. To understand the criminal, you must look at the crime. You just want to see if you can come up with an analysis based upon preliminary police reports, crime scene photographs, a profile of the, uh, the victim, autopsy protocol, reviewing that, re review the autopsy photographs, do a, an analysis of the overall crime, the risk level that the subject took, uh, the victim risk level, analysis of the, the area, the, the, maybe the crime scene, maybe you have multiple crime scenes. And then uh, based upon that, uh, you attempt now to come up with a specific type of, uh, type of profile. By examining every aspect of an unsolved crime, a profiler can determine specific characteristics of that killer, such as age, occupation, and physical characteristics. The troopers contacted the FBI to see if the Bureau could work up an analysis of the Anchorage killer. They hoped the profile would sharpen the investigation and bring overlooked clues to light. The troopers gave the FBI what they needed to build the behavioral profile. 
For a scrupulous, accurate profile, they required only facts from the troopers, no analysis or theories. Trooper Wayne Van Clausen didn't want to lose any time. The information he received from Officer Baker aroused his suspicions about Robert Hansen, but he needed more information. Criminal records were just beginning to be computerized, and he didn't have access to them all in Anchorage. While the profile was being developed, he went to Juneau to collect Hansen's records from the Superior and Supreme Court archives. In his fact-finding mission, Van Clausen researched every town that Hansen had ever lived in. He found reports on Robert Hansen dating back to 1961. He gathered all that he could carry, sent the rest by truck, then headed home. While he was in Juneau, the FBI had come through with a criminal profile of the serial killer. The fact that the killer was so prolific meant to Douglas that he could function unnoticed within the community. Someone who worked independently, most likely a business owner. The killer would be an avid outdoorsman, since the bodies were recovered in remote areas of wilderness. Since he preyed on prostitutes, Douglas concluded the killer had difficulty talking to women, had low self-esteem, and grew up feeling like an outcast. Based on killers with similar profiles, Douglas provided a specific characteristic to explain the cause of those feelings of inadequacy a feature that bore an eerie resemblance to Robert Hansen. The one that totally blew us all away, I think, is that when they, when they said he's either going to be, be a stutterer or someone who has a lisp, a speech defect, how do you figure that? But that was one of the things that they suggested might show up. The FBI profile pointed to Robert Hansen, but the depths of Douglas's insight were about to be known. Upon Van Clausen's return, troopers studied the files. The records showed that Hansen had spent three years in a reformatory for setting fire to his old high school's bus garage. Based on their work with previous killers, the FBI profilers said the killer would have a history of arson. You have a boyfriend? Yes, actually, I do. The profile painted the killer as a social misfit. Hansen's court-ordered psychiatric reports from his days at the reformatory bore this out. I'm really busy right now, you know? I don't, I don't mean anything like that. I mean, you know. His stutter was a social barrier that undermined his self-confidence. Whenever he tried to assert himself, he'd be slapped down. I've got work to do, or I'm going to call security on you. He never forgot the sting. The profile said the killer would learn to function as a normal member of society while his perversions festered within. His record showed that in his 30s, Hansen began working at a bakery. He would brag to co-workers about his kleptomania and the sense of power it gave him. He also bragged about his love of hunting. He took great pleasure in exerting power over his prey, stalking it, then wounding it. And he became good at the kill, winning prestigious awards. In 1967, he moved to Alaska to start a new life and for better hunting. Three years after moving there, his record showed he was arrested for the attempted rape of a young receptionist at gunpoint. He pleaded no contest to assault with a deadly weapon. A little more than a month later, he was indicted for the attempted assault of an 18-year-old woman he'd followed home. As soon as the man got to Alaska, he was involved in theft cases, he was involved in abductions, he uh, had psych psychiatric evaluations showing him to be really unstable and having all kinds of weird sexual fantasies and the rest. True to the profile, Hansen seemed a respectable citizen, so the courts were lenient. In one case, he claimed to have memory lapses and was given psychiatric treatment and five years in a work release program. 
He abducted one of his early victims outside a coffee shop, took her to a cabin.